Hello, Watchman of Ephraim here. This video is going to deal with the everlasting gospel. Here's the angel flying and announcing the gospel to the nations, this everlasting gospel in Revelation 14, 6. This mysterious gospel, most don't know what it is. And if they do, most proclaim that just a few are going to be saved, and most are going to either be tortured forever or annihilated. Revelation 14 is kind of a gloomy chapter, as well, towards the end of it, when you get into the so-called uh, uh, judgment of where people are smashed down uh, like grapes outside the uh, city of Jerusalem. But the, the everlasting gospel, quote-unquote, is actually very good news. It's the salvation of all of mankind every last fragment and to understand it you have to go to let me just um once again a key scripture here revelation 10:7 if you don't get this, you're never going to understand it. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Okay, so Revelation, basically the Torah and the prophets in symbolic language. So it's tipping you back, as I'll show once again when we get into Revelation 14, it's tipping you back to God's Torah, his instruction, by the way, which Messiah, it was given to him primarily to fulfill. The restitution of all things. So here's a better translation Oh, I will find it right here, okay? Now, this is Weymouth New Testament. Okay, verse 6, Revelation 14. And I saw another angel flying across the sky, carrying the good news of the ages. That's the better translation here of the ages to tell every nation, tribe, language, and people among those who live on the earth. Okay, this gospel, this good news, good news, gospel, evangel, good news of the ages to tell every nation, tribe, language, and people. Okay, this is the better translation of the ages because it's more than one age. So it's this, this, Quote unquote everlasting gospel. It's not a good translation there. So, this is the good news of the gospel of the ages. That's coming. It's actually here now, the few. This video I could probably spend two hours on. It might, it's probably going to go over an hour, but. Um, well, I could do a lot of scriptures. So why don't I just eliminate that? So where do we go? Now, now the, the Bible is a book. So it's a book. Where do we want to go? As I said, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. God told Abimelech in Genesis 20, don't touch Sarah. Abraham, he's a prophet. So Abraham's a prophet. Moses is the greatest prophet of all. So we have Genesis 22 here. Notice the offering of Isaac on the altar in the, in, on Mount Moriah, and 
uh, when he's uh, getting ready to do it, of course, the angel of God stops him. He says this. This is the beginning. This is where he gets the oath and the promise. But all this began in uh, Genesis chapter 12 concerning Abraham. And actually all the way back in Genesis 3.15. It just expands a little more. It's a book. You have to read through the book. To understand it. You can't start in the New Testament to understand it. So after Abraham does this and obeys God, God says this. Then the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Oh, well, that's uh, that gets into those latter days here with Ephraim and Manasseh. Sea gates. Notice verse 18. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. In your seed all the nations. Let's look at that word all right here. It's the Hebrew word kol, the whole or all. So let's take a look at this, um, what this means real quick. It means all, all for every, all his every, all his everything, all its entire, all and every, all of the every, all the everywhere, all throughout. So it goes on here, all to every, all throughout, all men, all these, all things, all together, always, annually, any. So look, this is, you can, read, can continue reading. It's just the same thing over and over again. Every and all, every of all, every of any, every pertaining to all, every man, every one, every one, everything, every way, every one, every one's, every one, everything. Why doesn't Orthodox Christianity, and most of Christianity, um, Torah keepers to Hebrew Roots Movement, Orthodox Christianity, you know, why especially Orthodox Christianity don't they get this? Because uh, when they get to the promises of Abraham, they go, they skip over the Torah and they go right into the New Testament and they read Jesus, Yeshua's words. Many be called, but few chosen, things like that. And they don't listen to what he said in John chapter 5, 45, 47. If you don't believe or understand Moses' writings, you're not going to understand my words. He spoke in parables, and he spoke incomplete to point you back to the Torah, to the instruction, to the teaching, which was given to him. Uh, after the promises were given to Abraham. In other words, there had to be a master, genius, thought out, intelligent plan uh, that God had to come up with after he gave this promise to Abraham. He swore by an oath and he promised him. Now there has to be an intelligent plan. It was buried in the Torah, the instruction. That Christ came to fulfill. Think not that I came to destroy the Torah and the prophets. I did not come to destroy. I came to fulfill. It's real simple. You just have to read the Bible like it's a book. You can't begin in the New Testament to understand the gospel, the gospel of the ages. Go on and read. Whatever, whenever, wherever, whoever, <laughs> whoever of any. I mean, it's it's pretty simple. Okay, so I've got some scriptures here, and I may add to them. This this may take a while. So after he gives this promise to Abraham to undo and correct what Adam and Eve loused up, 
Okay, so now we have the instru we have we have the law of Moses, which many people are keeping in the letter today to be righteous, which yeah, they're, I think they're, anyways, they're keeping the the, the works of, the, the, in these works of the Torah, the law, are the mysteries of the kingdom. Just don't realize it. I mean the full scope. Even the law of the leper or the sinner, the unrepentant sinner, who will be dealt with the second death, the destruction of the garments, the sinful garments. It's all in the instruction. So uh, I had a pen here. So I'm going to check these off as we go on here. Now we, we want to go on to uh, next. So in the Torah... Exodus 23, we've gone to this many times. 23, this is Messiah read this. He took this as an instruction when he was a young boy. He read this and he laid these things up in his heart. Psalm 46, 8. Thy Torah I have laid up in my inmost being. In thy instruction. The master plan. To restore every fragment back to God. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread or Passover. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in, the, in, in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest. Okay. Once again, notice that term, harvest. The first fruits of your labors. Notice that, first fruits. Harvest, first fruits. You see that a lot, or especially harvest in the Gospels of your labors, which you have sown in the field. In the field. What's the field symbolica? Even Paul said that to the Corinthians in chapter 3 of the 1st Corinthians. You are God's building. You are God's field. And the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. What was that fruit? What was the primary, primary fruit? Or what was this? What's this also called? Ingathering or tabernacles? The grape harvest. And okay, once again, going on. Can check that off. This may be a long study. So Exodus 23, 14, 17. Wait, I did that. I'm sorry. Exodus 34. Verse 22. And you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruit of wheat harvest. Now we have wheat and harvest. Okay, wheat harvest. And the feast of ingathering at the end of the year. Notice the terms wheat and harvest. Okay, once again, you see that a lot in the Gospels. I may have to go to scriptures I didn't write down. But anyways, let's go to the next one. Okay. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Sixteen. And starting, let's start in verse ten. Verse 9. This is the Feast of Weeks reviewed. 
You got the Passover reviewed here. I could go on with that. I can I can get into that. I'm going to skip over that. The Feast of Weeks. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Notice the sickle. You begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God, to Yahweh your God, with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as Yahweh your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before Yahweh your God, you, your son, and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your, within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are among you. In other words, everyone at the place where Yahweh your God chooses. So these feasts, these three high feasts, Passover, which I didn't get into, the Days of Unleavened Bread, because something happened on that day. You should know the Passover. Well, Christ was crucified three days later on the uh, Feast of First Fruits, or the, the Day of First Fruits, he rose from the dead on a Sunday. So we get in here, the, the counting, the time you uh, put the sickle to the grain, that's the uh, wheat, or um, yes, the, uh, yeah, no, actually, right here, it's the uh, the barley, okay? And that symbolizes Christ as the first fruit of the first fruit. The stranger and the followers, the widow who are among you at the place where Yahweh your God chooses to make his name abide, and you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. When we translate that over, we have to remember that we were sinners, and this world, this is Egypt, is this this type of this world, which is the type of Egypt, the world of a world of sin, or this age of sin, this present evil, evil age. And we go on to Tabernacles. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor your wheat and your wine press. That's the grapes. And you shall rejoice in the, your feast, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to Yahweh your God in the place which Yahweh chooses, Jerusalem. In the future, New Jerusalem, because Yahweh your God will bless you in all the produce and all the work of your hands. That you, you, so you shall surely rejoice three times in a year. All your males shall appear before Yahweh your God in the place which he chooses. It is commanded. It was given to Messiah that all must appear before Yahweh in their appointed times. The males were simply the head of the households. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, what happened during Unleavened Bread? That's when the first fruit was risen, as we'll re I'll review with you again. At the Feast of Weeks, or, or Harvest Wheat. So here at Unleavened Bread, you, have, you had the Barley Harvest, the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, or Ingathering, and they shall not appear before Yahweh empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to your talents, according to your abilities. Translate that over spiritually. Everyone's going to have something to contribute in the future. Okay. Let me check that off. Once again, Leviticus... Of Leviticus 26. I think the the, the NIV is a little better for this um, this translation here. Three to five. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey, to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crop, and the trees their fruit. Your threshing—that's the barley and the wheat. 
will continue until the grape harvest. And the grape harvest will continue unto planting. That's the planting of the what? That's in the spring again, the barley and the wheat. You will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I'm trying to show you these different harvests, which will show up in Revelation chapter 14. Okay. Check that off now. Let's just um, oops, I didn't have this down. Leviticus 23. The appointed festivals, the appointed times, the po the appointed moedim, moedims. Uh, I do not keep these anymore in the letter. These Keeping these in the letter will not save you. I keep these in the spirit. These were given to Messiah. These are works of the Torah that Messiah is going to fulfill. Example, Passover. It was given to him to fulfill. He is now our Passover lamb. And we now eat the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. No, we don't literally eat matzos anymore to be righteous for seven days. It was given to him. He is the righteousness of God. 1 Corinthians 5.21 So the Sabbath is simply all these feasts summed up into one day. Okay. Let's review the first fruits. That's right here. This is the, the, the feast, the day of first fruits. The high priest would wave it on the morrow after the Sabbath. This was Christ to be accepted. This is the first of the first fruits. This was the guarantee of a future harvest, and it's going to be a massive harvest. Every single fragment. The Messiah is going to correct everything that was done wrong with Adam and Eve. Of course, God knew this beforehand. It was a genius plan to put all under sin so that all will have the opportunity to claim one man's righteousness so that none would be lost. It is a genius plan. Yahweh said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I am going to give you and you reap its harvest, that's the barley harvest, I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheep of the first grain of your harvest. He is to wave the sheep before Yahweh so it will be accepted on your behalf. Guarantee of a future harvest. I should um, get rid of some of these pictures. They're never in order. Okay? He waves it. Okay? The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. Okay? When did Christ, when did, when did Messiah rise? The day after the Sabbath. Most likely crucified on a Thursday. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ is risen and has become the first fruits of those who slept. Paul had to go into the synagogues and show from the Torah, the Psalms and the prophets, uh, these things to be true. To prove he was the Christ to these Jews in the synagogues. That's what he was doing. Okay. He was the son of God. He's the first fruit. He was the first one to be saved. That's why we have to have his faith to be righteous, to begin with, not our own. That's how bad our condition is. God considers our condition and how much he exalts his son. That's why he is now the righteousness of God and not the Ten Commandments anymore. 
in the letter. Okay. That by the works of the Torah will you be justified, or more properly translated, righteous. Okay. This is how much he thinks, or how much he exalts his son. Okay. On the day you shall wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to Yahweh Lamb when you're old. Okay. We we know that, okay? I mean we I mean we we know he was the Lamb. Okay, so that happened during unleavened bread. Messiah had to believe the scriptures himself, and he did. And we have to have his faith. He believed God. He was able to save him from death. Read Hebrews 5. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Now this is Pentecost, weeks, the Feast of Harvest. The first fruits of the labors of the field. Count 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath. That gives you an eighth Sabbath. It's a, it's a high day. It's a high Sabbath. It's an eighth day. After the seventh Sabbath, the day after, it's a first day of the week, Sunday. And then present an offering of new grain to Yahweh. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of an ephah of fine flour, baked with yeast as a wave offering of first fruits to Yahweh. Two wave loaves. That's the Gentiles, and that's the, the Israel. That's the first fruits to Yahweh. Okay. Okay. Of course, going down. And Yahweh said to Moses, say to the Israelites, on the 15th day of the seventh month, Yahweh's festival of tabernacles, or ingathering, ingathering, ingathering. That's Revelation chapter 20. Begins, and it lasts for seven days. On the seventh day, you shall have Hoshana Rabbah. Let me just type in here, uh, Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana Rabba. Uh, Triumph Pro. I'm always talking about Hoshana Rabba here. The awesome mystery of Hoshana Rabba. This is the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the second resurrection. It's going to be about a hundred year judgment of the billions who were never saved. This is the time. Hoshana Rabbah. Many salvations. Great salvation. When they will cry out to Messiah. Cry out to God to save us. That's what Hoshana means. Save. Save us. Save now. Save Yahweh. Save us, Yahweh. Powerful word. Okay. This is when the Spirit of God is going to be poured out in abundance. I've been meaning to do this. As I should just read it. It's very dry and it's, it's, it, there's, it's dry. A lot of it's dry and boring. But I should just read it anyways, just to educate you on it. This is when he stood up in the temple on the last day of the feast in John chapter 7. And he cried out, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. When he said that the priests were pouring wine and water from the spring of Gihon on the altar. It was the most joyous day of the festival. Okay, let's get rid of that. 
So we have the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. Okay, seven days. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall have offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day, now we have the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It's a sacred assembly. That's the consummation of the ages. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 22. Okay, real quick here. Matthew chapter 23, or Matthew chapter 20, or 13. Oh, by the way, get rid of that. There's the wheat. There's the wheat harvest. I'll uh, go to uh, Mark chapter 4. We can see Christ, we can see Messiah's words. He got them from Moses. He got them from his father. There's the, there's the, the sickle to the grain, the first fruits, the wheat harvest. Okay. Well, just to look up grape harvest, you can type in tabernacles and grape harvest. You'll, you'll get... Um, You'll get all kind of stuff. You can read about, you know, threshed and the grapes have been pressed, all the stuff about the grape harvest. So there's, there's once again, there's a picture of the grape harvest. This is the time the grape harvest, 6,000 years have been allocated to mankind uh, to go his own way. He's only calling out a few people at this time, those who are called faithful and chosen. He sees calling them out, and by their volunteer, of course, they're called from the before the foundation of the world. These are the ones that have to go against the world and Satan to overcome as Christ overcame. And they will reign with him with a rod of iron. Okay, they're going to, they're going to, this is the time when the, the millennium begins. He's going to begin to forcefully uh, put all his enemies under his feet. Time's up. 6,000 years, a man has allocated him to go his own ways and do his own things. Six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is the, Sabbath of Yahweh your God. Okay, this is the grape harvest. Tabernacles. Okay. Matthew 13, 33. A seemingly horrible chapter with this furnace of fire. It's actually uh, the uh, lake of fire. It's actually uh, where the lepers will go. Numbers 5, 1, 5, 1 through 5. Command that the children of Israel, they cast out of the camp. This is all, this is, this is the new Jerusalem here, the nations all around. It's all in Torah. It's all in instruction. It's all, it's, it was an, it's, it's an instruction to him to fulfill. And now everybody's running around and more and more people are running around keeping these works to be righteous. These were just simply for him to fulfill. That's why they're not accounted for us to, for righteousness. He wants the fruits of the Spirit from us. These were given to him to fulfill. So then we're going to have the lepers outside. <laughs> What, well, during these three high feasts, when all of Jerusalem, when all of Israel went up to Jerusalem, this uh, the tabernacle, and that is a type of the new Jerusalem, the Levites in the sons, the Aaron and the sons, Christ, and these uh, 144,000 that will be in and around, right? The camp of the saints and the holy city, Revelation 20. Okay. When they went up, Three times a year to keep these feasts. Who were the sinners that couldn't participate? The lepers. They had to remain outside while these festivals were going on. And their garments were being burned in the fire and washed with water. It's the, don't you, I mean, it's all, it's, 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 it's a masterpiece of, of, a, of a blueprint. It's the mystery that Paul talked about. 
and Christ talked about in, oh, we're in Matthew. Matthew 13, 33. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. What did I just, what, what have I been going over? Passover, unleavened bread, feast of weeks, or day of first fruits, and then after that, feast of weeks, harvest, the wheat harvest, the first fruits, the labors, the first fruits of the field, the labors of the field. You have this mysterious parable that almost nobody knows. Seems like a horrible chapter. The parable of the tares explained. I can go on here. Sent the multitudes away, and they wanted to, the disciples wanted him to explain the parable. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. There's the field. Right? The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest, the harvest is the end of the age. The good news of the ages, the gospel of the ages. This is the present evil age. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. These are the lepers. He can't add or take away from his father's word, his instruction. The enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. What's the harvest? And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdoms all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, the lepers, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. They go outside the camp. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Right? This is how he describes the uh, the uh, the uh, tares and the uh, well here the wheat. First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to, to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Right? Gather the wheat into my barn. Where did he get his terminology? From Torah. His father's instruction. His teaching to him. Primarily, these are the things that he was ordained to fulfill. Hebrew Roots Movement, Torah Keepers, keeping these things in the letter. And they don't even have it because they're, they're, te they're, pra they're be getting bigger and bigger, Hebrew Roots, into annihilationism. I believe God is closing their eyes. Okay. Oops, let's go back here. One. First Corinthians fifteen. First Corinthians fifteen twenty two. Now let's start in verse 20. But now Messiah is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Where'd Paul get his terminology? The Torah guy. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, right, the curse of Adam, even so in Christ, or Messiah, the second Adam, all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Messiah, the first fruits, right? 
Got it? The first fruit. Of the first fruits afterward, those that are Messiahs, the Feast of Weeks, the 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 Feast of Harvest, the fruits, the first fruits of the laborers of the field at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom, the end, the telos. He delivers up the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Oops. Got it. Hebrew Jewish idiom for judgment. As I did a video on this before. The grape harvest. This is why Paul used that term. Putting all things under his feet. It's going to begin to smash down the nation. It's going to begin to forcefully rule over them. All right. This is the good news, not the bad news, that most all on the planet are falsely witnessing. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will be subject to him who put all things under him. Everything's going to be restored back. All things. Pass here. Everyone, everybody, everything. Right? All. That God may be all in all. This is, this, is, this is the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is why you get scriptures like this. I'm not going to do Mark uh, chapter 4. That's a good one, though, about, about the wheat. Putting in the sickle. When the harvest is ripe, as soon as the harvest is ripe. 1 Timothy 2. Starting in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, God our Savior. He's ultimately the Savior. This is his plan. Who desires, who will, better translation, have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Messiah Jesus, or Yeshua, who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time, or the appointed times, or the fit time, or the fit times. This is where Paul got his, uh, his, his doctrine or truth. Okay, now let's just go ahead and examine Revelation 14. As he declared to his servants, the prophets. Then I looked and behold a lamb, a lamb, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. When was the lamb re resurrected from the dead? When did he die? Passover. When was he resurrected from the dead? The day of first fruits. Get it? He's kicking you back. A lamb on Mount Zion. What goes forth to the nations uh, when the 144,000 are with him on Mount Zion in the last days? Isaiah 2, 1, 4, the Torah, the instruction will go out. With him, 144,000. Who are these 144,000? Well, let's just cut to the, you know, chase here. It tells you. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits 
as he declared to his servants the prophets, to God and to the Lamb, who is the first fruit of the first fruits, the barley wave offering. Okay? Then you have this proclamation here. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the better translated, the gospel or good news of the ages to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment, judgment has come. So what's coming? What's after the Lamb and the 144,000 resurrected? It's time to put all your enemies under your feet. It's time for the grape harvest. As he declared to his servants, the prophets. Okay. Oops. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. Worship him, not them. God is one. There's only one God. And another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen. Okay, this ties in with uh, Jericho and the overthrow of Jericho. What happened with Jericho? You now the city was, was, was devoted for destruction to Yahweh. But the silver, the gold, the bronze, the iron was devoted to go into the treasury. Why? It represents humanity, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. The symbolism, the figurative language, the mysterious written code in the Torah. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath for fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead and on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tested, Basanos, I just did a video on that, with fire and brimstone. These are the lepers, as he declared to his servants, the prophets, Leviticus 13. No more death outside the camp, because Christ has put that away, who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb. Abolished death and brought immortality. Life and immortality to light. And the smoke of the torment ascends for the age of the ages. Terrible translation. And they have no rest day and night who worship the beast in his image, wherever he receives his name. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those to keep the commandments of God. No, I don't believe that's the Ten Commandments in the letter. And the faith of Yeshua, Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in Yahweh from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Okay. That's uh, the first fruits again. Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having in his head a golden crown. By the way, this uh, keep the commandments of God, that's a whole uh, another video in itself. It's boiled down to look at Philadelphia. Church, Philadelphia. Love, it's going to be love. Uh at the end of the age, uh, iniquity is going to abound, and the love of many is going to grow cold. It boils down to believe on the one whom he has sent and love one another. The Son of God, believe in the one whom he has sent, John, through 1 John 3.23. Jesus Christ, his Son, and love one another. These people are going to be known once again for their love for one another in a time where life will hang in the balance. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice.
to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is great. So he's, he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on, on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So here's another harvest. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar, came from the altar, the altar, the bronze altar, the golden altar in heaven. Sacrifice, who had power over fire. These people are going to be purified. Who had power over fire, altar, fire. They're going to be purified. And he cried out with a loud cry to him who had a sharp sickle, had the sharp sickle, yeah, the sickle again, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine, or gather the grapes, the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. This is the beginning of the what? This is the gospel of the ages. Oh, there's going to be a great slaughter in the valley of Jehoshaphat outside of Jerusalem when he comes back for sure. They'll be raised from the dead and they will by force Come under the feet of Messiah. Makes sense. And those that are still resistant will go outside. Like the lepers were thrown out. Leviticus 13 and 14 again. He shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp which in Revelation 20, I forget what verse, is called the camp of the saints in the beloved city, as he declared to his servants the prophets. Gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe, so the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle, 1,600 furlongs. It put all enemies under his feet. Yeah, I must have... Uh... That's what it is. As he declared to his servants, the prophets, you just got to go back into the Torah first. You got to start with uh, Abraham and his blessings. And you got to go into the Torah. Three times in a year, all your males shall appear before Yahweh. The representatives of the house of of, of the uh, representatives of the household, and then he says everybody, maid servant, man servant, Levite, stranger, everyone, stragglers will go outside until they uh, they'll gnash their teeth. Oops, excuse me, I'm getting a little tired. They'll gnash their teeth to get into the city. So they'll sit out there and they'll go through a purifying process. And you, the priest, if you or, or if I'm in that, if I'm accounted worthy of, to attain that age, you'll go out and you'll be the one that have to uh, see whether they are all the sarat, leprosy, or sin is out of them. Okay, there it is. So thank you for your time and thank you for listening.